Welcome to This Week in Local, a Locology podcast featuring lively conversations about the local digital ecosystem, hosted by Locology analysts Mike Bolin and Charles Lachlan. Hello, everyone. I'm Charles Lachlan, your co-host, joined by Mike Bolin. Mike? Hi, Charlie. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. We'll be saying that for a while. I think we covered that on the last episode. So, Mike, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what's on your mind, what you're working on? Yeah, so it's interesting. Last week, or in the last episode, we talked about sort of the propensity for the tech press to jump all over any sort of quote unquote killer designations. Right. Like so and so is the latest Google killer, right? It's the shot and fraud. It's all that stuff we talked about. Um, and of course, it's always overblown. Um, so, sort of the latest example of that I've been watching is sort of calling the death of ad supported media in general. And I think that there are two things driving that. So, one is the the age of privacy reform, where you know the legislative and platform level reform drastically inhibits the data collection that has sort of previously driven the the golden age of ad tech the unchecked era of just like targeting and targeting and you know it, it got a bit abusive out of control and now obviously we're in this sort of privacy moment and and you know the ad support of media has been called as like the the victim of that and it is but it, you know it's not dying the the second faction is the web3 crowd and we talked about this last week where you know instead of audience aggregators like media companies and social networks that essentially provide free content in return for enduring ads. The idea is for all of that to be replaced by this sort of decentralized peer-to-peer -peer media consumption and compensation model where you basically sort of pay artists and entertainments or, or whoever's entertainers, excuse me, um, directly through micropayments. So in that sort of worldview, the social networks, the media networks, they all go away. Um, and as we talked about last week, the issue there is that, you know, if you kill the network, you also kill the network effect and the, right. the mechanics for content aggregation and discovery. But that that's a different point. Back to this sort of death of ad supported media, the Web3 crowd believes that it really has no part in this like new regime. So basically boiling all that down, if, if you look at all of the above, there, there's one major issue and, and all of this sort of speaking on behalf of consumers and their interests and all this sort of virtue stroking, no one thought to ask everyday consumers what they actually want because it turns out that they don't want to pay for media, at least all of their media. There's still, you know, some premium content you pay for your movies, your Spotify subscription, a lot of subscription basis businesses doing well these days. But what we're talking about here in, in the sort of overblown sort of media is dead sort of narratives is like paying for everything that you consume instead of enduring ads, which again, no one really wants. So to wrap some numbers around that, Gallup and the Knight Foundation asked consumers and, and they framed it with the proxy of news content, right? So it turns out that only 9% of consumers want to pay for that content and a majority at 52% think it should be ad supported and are okay with that and and the remainder remaining sort of part of the sample was calling for things like you know government should pay for it or this or that but anyway 52 percent said they're okay with ads. only nine percent want to pay directly um and then in closing here it's interesting the only segment that did sort of over index for wanting to pay for content was the rich. So individuals who make $150,000 or more per year, 15% of them or among the survey respondents wanted to pay for news instead of seeing ads. And, you know, obviously they have the money to pay for it right. um, compared with again, 9% of the overall sample. So all in all, these movements are sort of virtuous in their intent, but a bit delusional in that they don't align with what, you know, consumers actually want vis-a-vis -vis ad supported media. Okay. That's really interesting. And, and you know, I sort of share your skepticism about the death of ad supported media and that data you just cited seems to uh, back us up here, back our instincts up a little bit. I think what is interesting, and this is a world that we've both sort of traveled into one degree or another is the amount of sort of niche content out there that is not ad supported but that is subscription supported i'm thinking of yeah the newsletter world which has become a big deal over the last few years definitely you know, Substack, and and there's a bunch of Substack competitors now um 
you know, Patreon was or kind of what Substack came after, and now there's Beehive and a bunch of others. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of big-name journalists over the years have migrated from the uh, ad-supported media world into the subscription-supported mm-hmm. media world, you know, be- becoming Substack bros, so as it were. And some have done quite well, but I think there's, uh, I think there's a general perception that, you know, after – you were, you know, 150k plus per year uh, wage earner <laughs> has bought three to four Substack subscriptions. They're not going to buy the fourth or fifth or sixth, and yeah. so it's it's kind of a, a world that's limited to a few players at the top of the pyramid. That's my gut sense of that, um, yeah, and that, I don't know where that goes. That that's that's a good point, and I should say to sort of qualify all of the above mm-hmm. that you know. The the sort of I, I alluded to this a little bit the sort of subscription based model mm-hmm. and that includes the things you mentioned newsletters it's also like streaming services Netflix sure. Amazon Amazon Prime HBO Max all of these are actually doing quite well and it's good to see that sort of the world has been conditioned to start to pay for more especially right. with respect to like good journalism like when you look at the Wall Street Journal New York Times the Economist you know people are paying for their sort of digital subscriptions and that wasn't the case ten years ago when everyone was sort of calling for the you know the death of newspapers i think it just took a transition so it's good to see all that and it, there's always going to be some mix right some mix of the content you consume that is premium and you're paying for and then some that is ad supported um and, and so i guess the what that means is like nothing to see here folks like all of this sort of hand waving about this sort of revolution in content consumption and comp- compensation it's sort of like the the same dance, but a different song. We're going to continue to have this mix. Yeah. Now, the the shares within that mix could shift more subscription, less ad supported media content. But yeah. all in all, what we're going to end up with is is both, yeah. um, where the sort of premium stuff tends to be the stuff you pay for, and the sort of backfilled daily content, the background stuff, the network TV, radio, all of these things are going to continue to be ad supported, and we'll simply have both. And I think there's a different set of expectations among the consumer of the content for yeah what they're getting. I mean, you know, what are you getting from Netflix? What you're getting from a Substack newsletter that you really look forward to landing in your email yeah. box versus the free newsletters that you ignore. You yeah. know, and uh, you really expect from something you're paying a premium rate for. You're expecting yeah, the- something very specific and very high quality and very yeah specific um, is the key un, word un. Uh, Messed with, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, un- uninterfered with, I guess, in terms of editorial direction. Yeah, specific is the key word. There are a few sort of signals or, or I guess, attributes that yeah. sort of go into that price elasticity equation of what am I willing to pay for. And I think a few things are, one, obviously quality. That higher premium quality stuff, like, you know, I, I'll mention a few names again, The Economist. You know, people right. pay for The Economist, The New Yorker, stuff like that. Um, but also the specificity, I think, is an important point. If you are someone that is, say, an ad executive, you might pay for the subscription to – ad week or media post or those sort of you know parochial or vertically specific things where you're getting specific domain expertise where it helps you do your job better makes you more informed as opposed to more sort of generalist content so i think that specificity tends to get people to open their wallets and that's why these newsletter platforms are interesting because there's probably i don't know the name of the newsletter but there's probably a retired ad exec who launched a Substack? Maybe after yeah. six months of building a free audience, went paid so that that ad exec could get really, really high-level, insightful content around the direction of the ad industry or something. Yeah, I'm sure there's several of those on these platforms, and there's probably a few players doing quite well creating that content and selling it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, that's it's a very new world in terms. It's very atomized. It's very uh, uh, fractionalized, but in a way, I think that serves the consumer. More yeah. so that more takes choice, something away from them you know, or, or requires – it may require them to go to more places to complete their information diet, Yeah, but, but, but there is more rich content out there.
Yeah, and that sort of gets closer to some of those Web3 ideals, which it sounds like yeah. I was totally trashing. I'm actually behind that decentralization. <laughs> Substack, is it, it gets closer to that idea of peer-to-peer, -peer, paying people for their time and their talent, uh, as Scott Galloway likes to say. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good thing, but like some of the Web3 fanaticism has just gone a little too far, but it actually, at its heart, has a lot of good virtues in terms of yeah. where media is already going and should. Yeah. Um, now... Um, Charlie, let's let's move on. Uh, that's a very macro topic. I think it's interesting. You also today have a very macro topic in terms of like some of these overall trends, but yours is less about media and more about the way we, the way we work and the continued shifts in the in the sort of workplace right, uh, right, hybrid, right. all that. Uh, yeah, I'll be. I just uh, published something on Locology Insider, our online publication at Locology, which you and I both contribute to. Uh, regarding Shopify this week, I don't know if they so much they announced internally and then the memo leaked out. I, I imagine without much resistance from Shopify uh, to to venues like Bloomberg and CNN who reported on it, and the the basic gist was that Shopify issued an internal edict among its employees. This is not a product feature. This is a workplace ruling at Shopify that recurring meetings, basically the dreaded Wednesday at 10 a.m. Zoom, you know, product roadmap check-in call uh, is now being eliminated. And uh, so basically, you know, all recurring meetings swept out of the calendars of Shopify employees. There, and, and, and they said there's a two-week cooling off period. I don't know from what date, from whatever date that memo went out. I think it was earlier this week. Two weeks before you can even think about rescheduling that recurring meeting. And, and I think they've just created a cultural uh, norm with one memo, or at least they're trying to, a cultural norm of resisting meetings like this. Basically, if you don't want to be in the meeting, you can hit no. And you have permission. Uh, the permission has come from the C-suite on down that uh, we're now a culture of saying no to meetings, essentially. And what I thought was interesting about this is I learned about it from all the people commenting about it on LinkedIn, which is how I learn a lot about a lot of things I end up writing about. But in this case, I thought it was interesting that people were jumping in and saying, yay, Shopify, here's why this is awesome. Here's why I think maybe it didn't go far enough or whatever. What was interesting is the ones I noticed were from people who were big and local, and I'll name two in just a second, who are were building future of work businesses. So I think what it sort of said to me was is because I think last week on the the podcast actually we just uh, published earlier this week one of the things we talked about uh, was you know will 2023 be a year of startups and what will be the categories that people are going to pour their time and energy and, and dollars into to, to launch and I said oh, it's got to be AI metaverse I was just throwing things out into the into the air because I had to say something. I think one of the other ones I didn't think of at that moment, but now is occurring to me, is that I'm wondering if future of work will be a, one of those categories that will be getting a lot of, of attention this year. And so the two who weighed in on this were Howard Lerman, who we've written about, we've talked about a lot. He's launched Roam, R-O-D-A-M, which is basically a software environment for running a hybrid workplace. Uh, he's out there just trying his best to get us aware of what Rome is, what problems it's trying to solve. And basically the problem he says it's trying to solve is the default 30 minute Zoom meeting is like the default norm from hell. He didn't say that in those words, as a, that's my paraphrasing. Uh, and the other was David Shim, who I think you know pretty well, Mike, uh, yeah. used to run Foursquare. And then he uh, has launched, I think both of these companies were launched in 2021, notably pandemic year um something called read dot read ai i don't think there's a dot in there um there might be and this is basically a ai driven as the name suggests set of tools to optimize the effectiveness of online meetings you see so you get an automatic transcript real-time metrics on how what engagement is like within the meeting after action reports tldrs you know, uh, here's what you're committed to do in the meeting. It's, you know, lots of reporting and robust um, extraction of, of insights and findings and action items from, I mean, it's really interesting idea. So these, these guys are both building companies trying to use 
the most advanced technology available to optimize the sort of new hybrid work environment. And it made me wonder who else is building around this topic as well. So that's basically what was getting my attention today. Yeah. Very interesting. So I, you know, like a lot of the comments you read, you know, I applaud this move by Shopify. I think that the sort of repetitive motion of recurring meetings can be toxic in that, you know, it doesn't let this sort of the dynamics or the merits of a given topic or need to have a conversation lead the way. It's sort of form over function. It's like it just becomes, you know, I, I need to talk to you for five minutes or I may need to talk to you for an hour and a half about something more in depth, but it just seems to get shoved into this container that is a 30 minute weekly meeting and, and or, or we don't need a meeting this week, but we kind of do it anyway. And I think it's become an environment where underperformers sort of use that to like, oh, we got a meeting coming up at noon. Um, it's 10 a.m. now. I'm not doing anything till then. And then after the meeting, oh, I was, I, now I got to wind down. And it just becomes this sort of right. Like, instead of do of the things, things you agreed to do in the meeting or whatever. Yeah. One of the things to make underperformers seem or feel busy, but also it puts the cart before the horse. I guess that's the bigger point. It puts the cart before the horse in terms terms of the functionality of the thing I need to get done and I need your time and we need to collaborate on it and let's let that lead let's let's let um, form follow function as they say and yeah. I think that's one of the core tenets around around Rome and what Howard's doing in that let's let's let form follow function where the corporate norm for years and years and years in this sort of highly need to highly structure everything is form over function uh, and that's that's the heart of these sort of you know, these meetings. And and I shouldn't say, I'm, I'm hesitant to make these blanket comments. That's sort of how I feel. There are some environments where maybe you have a lot of millennials or just new trainees and they need hyperstructure. Sometimes you need environments where um, that sort of gets in the way. And I think that it's situationally dependent, but just in theory, I definitely applaud this in just, you know, letting the, the, the sort of needs and the functionality of executives that need to be productive and need to collaborate, just sort of formulate that, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis in their sort of time management and, and, you know, standing meetings just sort of, I think, um, are, are antithetical to that. Right. Well, I think one of the um, premises behind Rome, as Howard articulated, I didn't talk to him, but he's done a lot about this specifically. He will be at our conference next April to talk about this mm -hmm. and related topics. Um, but what he has said publicly about this, you know, I think I alluded to a moment ago was, you know, the default 30 minute Zoom meeting being sort of, I, he's used a lot of words to describe how bad that is. But basically, Rome's um, idea is that uh, in a sort of in the days of yore, the one to one serendipitous impromptu meeting was how a lot of creative ideas got uh, ignited and pursued. And the, the idea is he wants to recreate that environment where those short impromptu meetings occur, as opposed to a lot of structured scheduled meetings that maybe are at a sort of, you know, default amount of time that's either way too little or way too much for what needs to be handled, right? And and he said, like, you know, the average meeting length is eight minutes, 34 seconds. I, I assume that will have to change over time. I don't think that can be a static average meeting length. That's the number he's been using, which sounds like a reasonable amount of time to have a good conversation about a single topic, right? Yeah. And uh, 30 minutes seems way too much for that. Not nearly enough to, you know, do a lot of things and way too much for most things that we do during the course of a workday. Anyway, so this is an interesting, it was very interesting that this got so much traction, at least on LinkedIn. I didn't see one person say, oh, Shopify, that's a really bad idea to, you know, <laughs> to get rid of recurring meetings. No one hated that idea. Everyone was like, hell yeah. And um, I didn't see one comment that said, oh, Shopify might want to give this a second thought. You know, it, yeah. the only thing Shim said was it didn't go deep enough, you know, but, yeah. uh, but that was kind of pointing people towards what he's trying to do, which is do much more uh, deep work around extracting value out of meetings, you know, and using mm -hmm. software to do that, which is fine. And I think it's an interesting startup. Uh, but his take was sort of, I think both of their takes were dictated by what they're trying to achieve with their businesses. Uh, but the general takeaway from what Shopify is doing is, 
Yes, hell yes. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot more companies are going to get a lot more chatter on Slack saying, when are we going to do a Shopify and get rid of all these? I've got eight recurring meetings a week and I'd, I'd like to have zero, you know, yeah. can we do that? So well, I'll tell you, my, my M&A flag just went up as you were talking when we look mm -hmm. at what Rome's doing um, and what David Shim is doing mm -hmm. uh, with Read AI in terms of like some synergies there in terms of how it's structuring these meetings and then David for sort of um, analytics on the right. meeting. Uh, so there could be some uh, non-overlapping synergies we see there. Uh, so those two should be talking to each other if they're not. I already. would think, because you would think Howard would and his team would be working on Okay, what happens in that 834 <laughs> one yeah. on one that supposedly is going on all day long? And what what is being extracted from that? You know, are, are you extracting takeaways? Is it being recorded? Is it, you know, I don't know. Today right. I did some other interesting analytics where it's sort of biometric sing signals. Mm -hmm. Apparently what they can do is they can sort of detect when people are losing interest in a topic. So it can be right. structure sort of analytics, but also content analytics. Like if you lose them, when you start talking about X, Y, Z. If, if I understand it, there's like a dash real time during the meeting, you can sort of monitor. It's almost like monitoring the heart rate, the, heart, the vital it signs. Like it's like the right, vital yeah. signs of the meeting as it's happening. Exactly. And you, you can see if people are nodding off in effect yep. and losing interest or drifting away. So you can sort of conduct it sort of a dashboard like it's like a literal like car dashboard for i gotta slow down i gotta speed up i gotta whatever you know in order to keep this meeting humming along exactly really interesting stuff i don't know how well it's doing to be honest with you and uh, i think we should catch up with david soon to find out what's going on with that thing so at any rate mike i think this is a good point to end it for this week in local Thanks for joining today, and thanks to all of you out there for joining us, and we hope that you are enjoying the podcast and that you will subscribe, rate, and review, and reach out to us if you're interested in giving us feedback or if you're interested in talking to us about uh, having a guest on sometime soon, which we will begin relatively soon. Still no announcement there, but it's coming. Mike, anything else? Thanks, Charlie. No. Nope. Okay, we'll end it there. Happy thanks, everyone. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Locology's This Week in Local with Mike Boland and Charles Lachlan. Be sure to subscribe for more.